Uh, we had some trouble with the uh, with the, the, the pictures and with the uh, with the tone and with sound mixing. And did you have problems like these two before? Because when I watched your first movie, was it in Harm's Way? Yes. It was absolutely perfect. And when I watched our first movie, we said oh, we have a lot to improve still. <laughs> well, uh, fortunately, my my group, I have a lot of uh, professionals uh, on my staff. I have people that have worked in television and movies uh, and, you know, doing the lighting and doing audio. Um, the gentleman that does the sound has been an audio engineer for 40 years. So we were very lucky. Um, when we did In Harm's Way, um, it was still pretty rough. I mean, there was a lot of things that had to be worked out, in my opinion. Um, but it was, a, it was a, a proof that we could actually do it. And so, after seeing that, I thought, okay, well now we have the sets, and now we have the costumes, now we have to have everything else. You know, we have these beautiful sets, now we have to light them like they're the real sets. So we went out and we uh, bought a lot of lighting equipment. We probably have $300,000 in just, just lighting equipment. We have lights and scrims and C-stands, just like you would see on a regular movie set. We, we uh, you know, earned the money ourselves at our day jobs and we invested in it. And so when, but the good thing is, is that when we're not filming, we can rent that equipment out to other people to bring money back into the project and keep the project going. So these are things you have to think about. It's an investment, but then it becomes a sideline. So if you have all this equipment and you're only filming twice a year, wow, you know, I could, I could possibly rent this equipment. So fan filmmaking is an art form in itself. You have to know how to make movies, but then you have to figure out how you can finance the movie yourself. So that's half the battle. Are you doing, you're doing Star Trek, I assume, yeah, Star Trek fan films. Now, now we are doing a Star Gate movie, but the first movie was a Star Trek movie. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I forgot the, the present for you, told me about. Ah. There's uh, five minutes. Now, uh, where's the present? Right. <laughs> Don't lose it, I'll get it, just take it. Okay, okay. So, are you all diehard Star Trek fans? Yes? Yeah. What, what's your favorite Star Trek? Uh, the classic series. The classic series. The only series is I like to call it. <laughs> TOS, the only series. Deep Space Nine? Yeah. Yeah. Next Generation. Next Generation. Next Generation. Next Generation. I worked on Next Generation. I was a costumer uh, the first season into the early second season. I got to make Wesley Crusher's sweaters. <laughs> no, the first ones? The yes, all those weird sweaters and things. And then. Uh, I did, I uh, spent many hours cutting out spandex jumpsuits and putting them together. And uh, I can tell you that the whole first year of the show, all Will Wheat never wanted was a uniform. He hated <laughs> the sweaters. He hated that stuff. Sorry. Anybody else? Come on here. It's a Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you for being here, and especially thank you for keeping the dream alive. Star Trek, and uh, there is uh, well, there's so many things I want to say to you. Because, well, uh, please start. <laughs> uh, a lot of things, uh, especially uh, it's uh, nearly incredible um, when I first saw Cowboy Plane, the, 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 the pilot or the, mm -hmm. the first installment. Of or what we call White Mother. That's what I call the first one. Why bother? Yeah, but I, I even love that. You know, it's just, uh, maybe even a little bit more than. Harm's Way, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, I thought In Harm's Way uh, was a little bit too early, I think. It was such a, the story, it was a very really great scope of the story, and uh, I thought uh, maybe um, a little bit too much at that stage. Mm -hmm. um, whereas when Chekhov and Sulu, the two episodes that went afterwards, uh, they were really great, especially. Yeah. Uh, Great, because of course the, the original actors. Um, well, um, I think you are a natural born Elvis, but you're especially <laughs> a natural born Captain Kirk. So, uh, well, I'm very blessed. <laughs> and uh, for those of you that don't know, when I'm not enjoying Star Trek as my hobby, my my day job is is portraying Elvis live on stage with a, with a band and an orchestra and I tour in the United States and play casinos and theaters and all that kind of thing. And I've done that for 24 years. So that has been a, a great job and uh, an acting job and that you know has, has allowed me the, the privilege and to earn enough money to play Star Trek. So. Can I say, can I say something? 
Can I? No, I can't. No. <laughs> Let me explain too. When when we shot uh, Come What May, the pilot, and we did it in harm's way right after it, and I I told uh, Tobias this earlier that I was working as Elvis, which is why my hair looked that way. But what you don't understand is I would I would get up at nine o'clock in the morning or eight o'clock in the morning, and I would drive an hour to my job, and I was working for Six Flags, an amusement park company. And I was doing that seven days a week, performing five shows a day. I would leave the amusement park at six o'clock at night, I would drive the hour home, eat really quickly, shower, put on a Star Trek costume, and I would film until four or five a.m., get a couple hours sleep, and go perform. I did that for a week on each of those episodes. So. If there's problems with my performing in those episodes and they're a little under, now you know why. But I had to do that to earn enough money to even begin to make them. And I also had a, a, a partner at that time who directed them, and his name was Jack Marshall. And he uh, is a brilliant man. He, his, his talent is, is not in directing, but in scheduling. He's, he's more, a, more or less a producer, but he, he would rather direct. But he can take a script and break it down and know exactly how long it will take to shoot it and get the job done. But we didn't get along. He had his idea about what the show should be. He wanted to modernize it and make it a little more contemporary. And I was like, no, 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 no. I want it to be the 60s Star Trek, but I want it with modern effects. So I was thinking about Star Trek Remastered before they remastered it. That's what I wanted my show to look like. And so we constantly butted heads. And we finally parted ways. I, I fired him. And I took over the show beginning with World Enough in Time. So that's the first episode that I produced from beginning to end and called all the shots on and picked the staff and said, this is what we're going to do. And I think the proof is in the pudding. That was the first episode that I felt um, hit a home run from beginning to end. So. Um, yeah, um, I think um, I've got, well, two issues. Uh, first, um, that pilot episode, uh, the, mm -hmm. second, the second one. In Arms Way. In Arms Way. Uh, I think uh, in order to become a really great episode, it would need some um, redoing, uh, especially when it comes to the effect, uh, special effects. Yeah, you don't like the Roadrunner effects where the ship. Yeah, I just it looked a little bit. Um, let me let me explain something. When you're when you're when you're starting up a project like we were at that time, and the person that is donating their time, free of charge, to do all those effect shots says to you, the only thing I want to do is, is figure out the, the look of the thing and I don't really want to have any, you know, anybody telling me what to do, I just want to be able to do it and that would be my contribution. And he's saying, I'll give you 300 shots, 300 effect shots. You're like, hmm, okay. And you, you learn to work with people and let them have some creative freedom. You may not always like what happens, but it's, it's the trade-off for, for working with that, that person. And sometimes your creative ideas don't mesh, and that's what happened there. Beautiful effects, but the ship movements, the way the Enterprise kind of you know, barrel rolled and backed up and took off, and those kinds of things. You may not like them creatively, but that's why we let it happen, because that guy, with, uh, who, uh, Doug Drexler, was just uh, and is a beautiful man and donated many, many hours and that's how he always saw the Enterprise moving. He wanted to see it move like an F-16 airplane. That's what he wanted. So yeah. he said, okay, you do that. And, and no, he my, did. my major issue was with the Doomsday machine, actually. <laughs> yeah, how it moved? Uh, not a way of looking at it. Yeah, it was like serpent-like. Yeah, the, the, the moving and the, the, yeah. the surface, the, the texture, mm -hmm. just a bit off the thing. Well, that was then, this is now. Yeah. We, we've, we've changed a lot about the yeah. show. Yeah, I think it's, it's, uh, it's been improving a lot. Great. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I think it, it really took off the, the viewer first episode then. <laughs> oh, thanks. Thank yeah. you. We, you know, my goal, as I said, was just to, to tell stories the way they would have told them, you know, and take some risks. Star Trek, to me, uh, in the 1960s, took a lot of risks. They told stories that would upset, you know, the, the mainstream uh, public or the television censors of the 1960s and they got away with it because instead of you know black and white people there were purple and green people fighting and so the American censors weren't smart enough to figure out that, what the real message of the story was 
you know, they painted people half white and half black and had them fighting that way. And it was brilliant. You know, they had William Shatner kiss Michelle Nichols, and that was taboo in 1969. You have to, you have to try to go back to that mindset of what it was like to live back then. You know, when people turned on their television, particularly, you know, I know in Europe maybe it wasn't like that, but in the United States, if you turned your TV on in 1966 and you saw a spaceship with an all-American white boy in the captain's chair, with a Russian and an Oriental and a black woman standing, and they were all working together and they loved one another, that was wrong, man. That just that 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 was wow. That was something that a lot of people, uh, you know, weren't prepared to see. And in fact, uh, NBC told Gene Roddenberry, "You have to take the guy with the ears out because he looks too much like Satan." And everybody in the Bible Belt in the southern part of the United States will turn the show off. They'll they'll think it's satanic. So that's that was the thought process back then, which is why uh, my follow up to World of in Time was an episode called Blood and Fire, and it dealt with the first openly. Um, gay crewman on the Enterprise, and I thought, well, let's push the envelope a little further and let's make the gay guy Kirk's nephew. Let's really get the captain going. And I thought we did it well, and I thought we had a little fun with it, so. Yeah, definitely. Uh, my second issue, uh, you were on the Star Trek movie. Yes, I was. Um, it was kind of confusing because two captains on the bridge at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. Uh, there's, there's a little parody that we did. Um, and we're trying to get it finished, but we need some effects, and I've been bugging this guy over here that he's doing. The, I have to introduce you, by the way. The, this fellow sitting right here is Tobias Richter. Um, he's doing all the special effects for the show. He's brilliant. He's absolutely brilliant. And so, uh, he has a company here in, in Cologne called uh, The Light Works, and he's, he's doing all kinds of things, but he's doing a lot of phenomenal work for me, and, and uh, please, Give him a big hand, because he's just amazing. Really. Um, so we did a parody, actually. We took that clip from the movie, where I'm standing next to Zachary Kinto, and, and Zachary, it's just a quick, Zachary walks out and I kind of do a double take and look at him. And so then what we were going to do was have a special effect of the new Enterprise. We're gonna cut to that, and then cut back to me, and then we're gonna beam me out. And then you see the old Enterprise behind the new one and firing its weapons and blowing up the new one. And then I'm on the bridge with my Spock and he says, timeline restored, Captain. <laughs> but we haven't, done, we haven't finished it. We shot all the light out. We haven't put it together. But so now you know the joke. Yeah. Now, that's cool. Um, what I wanted to know, uh, can, can you tell us a story about that uh, filming of that scene? Of, of you on, on the sure. movie set and how the other actors were? Yeah. And, uh, Director. Well, I, I flew to California for personal reasons to go visit friends. And while I was on the plane, I had to have my phone shut off, of course. And we landed in Los Angeles, and the first thing you do when you land, most people, is you turn your phone on. So I turned my phone on, and I had 36 messages from one caller. And that caller was the guy that directed World Enough in Time, and it was Mark Zickery. And he said, James, you've got to call me. I know you're coming to Los Angeles. Uh, a Paramount executive wants to meet with us at Paramount because he's interested in distributing World Enough in Time. Hallelujah! Maybe Paramount will finally work with us. So I called him back and a meeting was scheduled. We went to the Paramount lot and I was with a couple of friends. We got there early because in Los Angeles, if you're driving and you, you want to leave two hours early to go anywhere. Traffic is just incredible. So you, we left very early, we got there early. And as we were walking around the studio, um, a friend said, you know, they're filming the new movie. And I said, yes. He said, well, let's go see what they're doing. And I said, no, we're not even gonna get close. Security is supposedly very, very high, and I'm sure they're not gonna let us you near know, the soundstage. So lo and behold, we walked over and we could walk right by. There was no security outside, you know, there was just normal activity. As I passed the entrance to the soundstage, J.J. Abrams came out on a break. He kind of looked at me, and you have to remember, when I'm not doing Elvis, I have blonde hair. And I had blonde hair. So he kind of looked at me, and I looked at him, and I just kept going. I didn't want to, you know, get into trouble for being where we weren't supposed to be or whatever. And as I passed, um, my buddy said, hey, that's J.J. That's Abrams. I said, I know, shut up, let's get going. And uh, they finally encouraged me. They said, why don't you at least turn around and say hello? And I said, oh, okay. 
As I stopped to turn, he got up out of his golf cart and he said, James Colley, what are you doing here? <laughs> so he knew who I was. Um, he did know Mark Zakri, the director. And um, I s explained quickly that I wasn't there, you know, to spy or look at the movie or what, that I was there for a business meeting. And he was wonderful and gracious. And he said, look, when you're done with your meeting, come back and be my guests on the Star Trek set. So we were like, whoa, this high security movie, they're gonna let us Trekkies into the movie. So we went to the business meeting, which didn't work out. And we were you know, very excited. We, at that point, we didn't even care about the meeting. We wanted to go see what was going on uh, you know, in the film. So we went into the soundstage and we waited and we couldn't, we could see they were in a set. There was one set, in the, but we couldn't tell what it was. And so we were waiting because um, the, he was giving direction to his people. They were preparing to, to set up a, a new shot. So we stood there and waited. And finally, somebody said to him, we were there. And he came down and he was really this energetic, happy man. And uh, he said, come on, come on, come on, I want to show you the bridge. So I couldn't get past the uniforms. Everybody was running around in these uniforms and I thought, wow, they got them right. They look like the old ones, but they're just new enough that it'll you know, be really cool for the fans. And we, we walked up on the bridge and I walked through the view screen because it was, it's an open space. And I stood there and I was frozen. And he was like, what do you think? What do you think of the bridge? What do you think? He was really excited. And I must have had this horrified look on my face. <laughs> because when I turned to look at him, he went, oh, you don't like the bridge. <laughs> and I said, it's a beautiful set, but it's not the bridge of the Enterprise. And he said, I get it, I get it. I, I'm not, he says, I totally get it. And, you know, he understood that I'd spent 40 years with that original show, and I was living it to this day, you know, every day, every day. And to me, that just didn't feel like home. It, but don't get me wrong, it was, and it is a beautiful set. When you walk in there, man, you feel like you're in a real spaceship because everything is just, you know, a beautiful video display. There's a complete ceiling, you know. Uh, it, it just didn't feel like the Enterprise to me. The cast, the people that were playing the parts, wonderful people. Carl Urban, I think he stole the movie. Did a beautiful tribute to DeForest Kelly. He was very, he is, he is a big Trekkie. Um, Chris Pine was very gracious. Uh, uh, JJ said, this is Captain Kirk, meet Captain Kirk. Uh, we had a great introduction. Um, it was just, they're just sweet people. Zachary Kinto was wonderful. Uh, Anton, Chloe, they, they were signing autographs for us right there. They didn't have to, you know, they were very gracious to all of us. Um, I was disappointed with the film. I didn't feel that Gene Roddenberry message of something of hope. I, what I saw was just a, a summer action movie. And, and that's not a bad thing. You know, it's just a different kind of film for a different time. And uh, I'm glad that it made a lot of money because it's got a lot of people excited about Star Trek again. And boy, we sure needed that. We really needed it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Again. Um, yeah, uh, sorry. So you, um, did you get any trouble with, uh, with using old script from the original Star Trek Phase 2? No. Because, no, no, no trouble? Listen, if, if I were going to get into trouble, I, I'm already in deep trouble for using the name Star Trek. Yeah. So, no. Um, when we first started making the episodes, um, we released the pilot, and the pilot was downloaded uh, like half a million times in 48 hours. And we were just, we, the computers couldn't keep up with it, the servers were crashing. We found out that the first AD on Enterprise, uh, David Trotty, he downloaded the episode, made a DVD, and he took it to work. And it shut the show down. The entire cast and crew of Enterprise was sitting around watching the show. And that's how Paramount found out about us, because it was right there, when they were supposed to be working, they were all watching it. <laughs> so the lawyers came down, and right, you know, wanted to know what was happening, where did this come from, and blah, blah, blah. So we got a phone call, really fast, and we were scared for about a week that they were just going to 
put the hammer down and say you can't do this because at that time, you, you know, things were, you know, when Next Generation and Deep Space Nine were on, Paramount was pretty tough. You know, if you were doing un unauthorized things, they would pretty much stop you. But then Star Trek started to decline in popularity, particularly in the States. Enterprise was not doing well. And here this group of fans made a Star Trek episode. Well, all the, the executives looked at it, the lawyers assigned to Star Trek looked at it, and they called us up. And they said, what are you planning to do with this? And we explained that we were just a group of fans, we really loved Star Trek, and this is our way of celebrating, you know, that, that love, that passion. You know, we can't come and be in a real episode, so we wanted to make our own. And thankfully, um, the lawyer that was in charge, her name was Shannon Johnson, she totally understood it, and she was a big fan of classic Star Trek. She said, okay, um, here's what we're going to do. You guys play Star Trek. Don't make any money, you know, because we're going to be watching. We're going to know. Don't, don't do anything. Don't, don't, you know, they gave us a, you know, some loose guidelines. And they said, we're just going to go be paramount, and you guys have a, have a good time playing Star Trek, but don't break the rules. And that's it. And all these years later, we haven't broken the rules, we're still making Star Trek, and all the fans are downloading it uh, better than ever. Yeah. So, I think it's great, you know, I think they finally understand the importance of, of the fans, you know, uh, and I think they in, are encouraging fans to, to really be more proactive with Star Trek, and really, you know, display their affection for the show, so, and I'm, I'm grateful. Yeah, and then earlier this day you told me that the sets, they are you know, private rooms. I have a building, a big building, that we, we lease. And is when it a you barn or what is it? Oh, it's, it used to be an automotive dealership, a very big place. And it had a repair garage on the, on the back of it and, and the showroom and so forth. And we took everything out, so it's this big, wide open building with 30-foot uh, ceilings. And when you go in, when you, you can lift this big garage door and you go in and right in front of you is the bridge of the Enterprise and the briefing room and sick bay and the transporter room. And then the corridors, we fold. In other words, we, we, we take them down when we're not using them so they're not in the way. But when we film them, we put them all up and we film. So 365 days a year, we have a building where if, you know, on the spur of the moment, we think, hmm, yeah, I want to go sit in the captain's chair. I can just go sit in the captain's chair. <laughs> And, and have some, you know, private thoughts. So, but it's there all the time. Okay. And uh, now I found the uh, little impression of friends and of mine and me, and we made this uh, 500 episode on a Sunday afternoon uh, in the basement of a friend's uh, house. And yeah, I want you to watch it. Great. There. I would love it. Thank you. I would love it. I love. I love to see fan films. Great. Because I don't speak German. Thank God. The Red Shirt Diaries. I think I've heard of this. I do. I, my translator is in the back. He's got a video camera. He's not paying attention to me. Hello He's there. My translator. Yeah. Anybody else have questions? Hello, Mr. Colin. Hello, I'm James, not Mr. Paul. Yes, Mr. James. Hello. <laughs> um, first, I have to thank you that you're keeping in that, uh, that beautiful way uh, the dreams and the work of Gene Roddenberry are alive. Thank you. Thank you. That's thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Questions. The first is a technical one. Mm -hmm. um, how do you uh, develop the uh, old music uh, for your shows? How did we what now? to um, develop the old music? How did we develop the old music? Develop? Is it a re-recording uh, re or did you uh, extract them from uh, the old? Uh, it is the original recordings. Yeah. Yeah. Original recordings. It is the original. Uh, it's copies of the original recordings. Do you um, um, uh, extract them uh, via a special program? For, uh, Program? No, what, what happened was is the gentleman that does sound on my show, um, physically he records the audio and then he goes back to California and he does the final mix and he puts the music in and the sound effects and all that. His name's Ralph Miller. Ralph used to work for Doug Grindstaff. Doug was the sound engineer on the original Star Trek and Doug had, uh, I believe it was Doug, he had copies of the original audio masters and uh, when they worked together Ralph was able to get copies of all of that. So we have the original music, and we have all the sound effects, and we have all those. Things. We have episodes, you know, that uh, people, that guess Paramount has even never released the music to some of the episodes. But 
course, by using that kind of music, uh, you honor the old composers. A uh, absolutely. Really I feel really that the music great. is as much a part, is as much a character of the original Star Trek as the Enterprise or Kirk or Spock, and that's why I like to use that music. In fact, I'd like to um, sh give you a demonstration of that. Is that okay? Can I give you guys a quick demonstration of how I've, important I feel the music is? I have a rough cut of uh, an episode that's coming out in the fall. Nobody anywhere on the planet except the people working on it have seen it. This is the original Phase 2 story called Katumba, where the Enterprise travels to the Klingon homeworld to stop a war. And I'm going to show you the opening clip and how important the music is. Because this is the first time in the history of Star Trek that you get to see Captain Kirk see a ridged head Klingon. This is the first time he's ever seen one. So I want you to remember the classic series music and how important it is when you watch this clip. Can you go ahead? Captain's Log, Stardate 2623.3. Urgent cryptic orders have mysteriously diverted the Enterprise to Space Station K-7 and the disputed area with the Klingon Empire. Jim, what's going on? Bones, you know as much as we do. I can tell you this much. We're not the only starship that's involved. We've monitored coded orders to 29 starships and 12 Starfleet installations. The sector's become extremely unstable since the disappearance of the Organians. The Klingons have become increasingly active after realizing enforcement of the treaty is now problematic. Gentlemen, let's get some answers. Well, I don't like it. This cloak and dagger stuff always manages to fill my sick bay. Let's get some answers. Mr. Scott, energize. Admiral Sheehan. Welcome aboard. Jim, good to see you. Good to see you. You know my officers, Dr. McCoy, Mr. Spock, Commander Scott. Scotty. Commander Probert, Captain Martin. What's this all about, sir? Well, the Klingons are about to destroy every vestige of peace we have with them. Well, there haven't been any reports of raiding or pirating in the system for quite some time. Well, they've been pulling back, gathering an attack force. Klingon battle groups are massing around every planet and station on the border. War games are not uncommon training tactics. No, 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 no. This is much bigger than any we've ever seen. Now, a massive attack on the Federation is imminent. Admiral, I have great respect for Starfleet intelligence, but trying to interpret Klingon mentality... Captain, it's confirmed. Epsilon-9 has intercepted and authenticated a battle plan that'll turn your blood cold. Our orders, sir. To proceed directly to the Klingon homeworld. And once there, convince the Emperor to give up this plan of war. To Kronos? With one starship? You're talking suicide. We'll be facing the entire Klingon fleet before we get a parsec in their space. Oh, you'll have an advantage. Mr. Scott, Beam over our guest. What guest? Your best shot at arriving on Kronos safely. He'll give you all the details you need in order to secure a safe mission. Remember when the Organians said that we would end up working together despite our many differences? Well, the two of you are going to have to do just that. You're going to have to stop this war before it begins. Thank you. 
struggle in the whole thing. <laughs> so you see when the Klingon appears how important that music is? Makes you feel like you're watching the old show. Yes, of course. Uh, my second uh, part of the question is uh, about the technical one, where it's um, about the actors, the famous actors, yes. Wendell, Wendell, uh, Wendell, um Walter Kinnick, uh, Dennis Crosby, and all the wonderful famous actors. Um, how do you get them on the show? Did they come by themselves, or did you address them first? Well, or? there's an old thing in show business. When you meet somebody, that person introduces you to somebody else, and that person introduces you to somebody else, and so on and so forth. Um, I, uh, of course, worked on Next Generation, and I was friends with the costume designer, uh, William Moore Tice. So, when I was there, I met quite a few people. And one of the people that I met was a gal named Camille Argus, who worked in wardrobe. She introduced me to uh, a guy in the art department named Doug Drexler. Uh, and Doug and I were cut from the same cloth. We both grew up watching the original Star Trek, and he was very active in fandom. And Doug introduced me to a friend of his from the United Kingdom named John Carrot, who you've seen on screen as Captain Karg. John uh, was a bodyguard in England at the conventions in the 1970s and 80s for Walter Koenig. So John uh, called me up one afternoon and said, you've got to get Walter to be in, in Star Trek New Voyages. And I said, well, that would be great, but I, I don't know Walter, and I'm not sure that he would be you know, willing to do this. And he said, look, um, I'm going to the Grand Slam convention in California. If you come, I'll set up a luncheon, and we'll, we'll talk to Walter together. I said, great, let's do it. So I went to lunch, and John introduced me to one of my heroes, and uh, he kept pushing me. He said, come on, tell him, tell him, talk to him. And so Walter finally got confused. He said, what? What do you want to talk to me about? So we pitched him this idea that we wanted him to come and be on the show, and we gave him the story idea, which was, you know, we wanted to, to pick up from the deadly years. He was the only one that never got sick. What if he got sick all, all this time later? And he thought that was a great idea. And he said, I would do it, I'd love to do it, let's, let's get it done. And in fact, let me call DC Fontana and see if she'll write the script for you. So Walter introduced me to DC Fontana. And then once that happened, Walter had such a great time making the episode, Walter would come to these conventions. Walter came to FedCon, I believe, and screened the episode. And at, at the convention, I'm not saying it was FedCon, I, I don't know which convention it was, he, he was talking to the show up a storm, you know, how much fun he had. A person in the audience was director, writer, Mark Scott Sickery. He, he went and talked to Walter and said, tell me more about this. I, you know, I love the classic Star Trek. So Mark Sickery called me, and he said, we have this script that was written in 1970 by Michael Reeves for Star Trek Phase Two, and, and, and uh, it's about Sulu getting lost in time and living this, this other life and coming back in a flash. And I know George Takei, um, if you want to do this, we'll try to, you know, we'll talk to George Takei. So I said, uh, let me read it. I read the script. It was phenomenal. Uh, he set up a meeting with George Takei. He went to George's house. George agreed. George called me. I spoke to George's agent. We, so you see how this happens. One person leads you to another to another. And, and all this time I've been doing conventions like this, so I get to meet and, and rub elbows with a lot of the other celebrities, and they think what we do is cool, and they want to participate. In fact, I just talked to uh, Manu. Manu wants to come on the show, so we're going to hopefully get Manu on and maybe get him out in June. i got a great idea. for. I think he would be great as Jim Kirk's older brother, Sam. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to hook him and get him to play Sam Kirk. So. That's how it happens. That's how it happens. Sounds like a dream come true. It is. I get to I get to play Star Trek. Nothing greater than standing on the bridge of the Enterprise in your uniform, and Walter Kane calls you Captain. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty cool. What about my hair? The hair of no, in, in the child. The Dalton character. The oh! Woman, she had well, tons of hair. And the, the let hair me explain. Yeah. Let me explain. You saw a rough cut. So there's some scenes that are missing that haven't been put in yet. 
Okay, you saw a very, very early cut of that. Um, unfortunately, the, the wrong cut was given to Peter and Stefan, who do all the hard work titling it. How many of you have seen Superman with Christopher Reeve in 1978? Can we see that movie? What did Lex Luthor do? Wigs. There's a scene that you haven't seen yet with Lieutenant Assel, and she's in her quarters, and behind her is a rack of different hair. And we came up with that because uh, John Povell directed the episode and wrote it. John was uh, a co-producer of Star Trek The Motion Picture. And he um, was the story editor for Star the original Star Trek Phase Two, And he helped create Idea with Gene. And nowhere in their original notes and drafts did it ever say Delt every Delton was bald. It said Lieutenant Idea was bald. So we thought, okay, the fans are used to having a bald Delta. We have this actress who's volunteering to come here from California and take time off of her regular job. We can't ask her to shave her head. She'll never be able to go back and just work. And you can't wear a bald cap convincingly. You always somehow see the line or the wrinkle in it or something. So we had to come up with a clever way to make her look beautiful, make her Delta. And so we thought, well, maybe this bald Delton likes hair to kind of make her fit in so people don't stare at her. So she wears wigs. Okay. And so we tried to keep canon and preserve this beautiful actress's hair at the same time. So that's why. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Captain. Uh, I see Star Trek in my, when I was a child, and then I grew up with the original series. And uh, last year I see first your original series, mm -hmm. and I said, oh, this is the same uh, feeling last uh, when I was a child. And I say, it is very great what you do, and you make very, he said, you make very uh, um, perfect optic and, and, and all of things. Uh, when it is coming, Germany, this, I can buy it in a store. <laughs> it's German, uh, it's German, uh, you know what? I will tell. I will give you the answer to that. Okay, yes. that will happen only when all of you German fans write to Paramount and say, "We want to buy this on DVD. We would buy this on DVD." If they think there's enough interest, eventually they would probably do something. But right now. It's you know just a fan show, and uh, and that's the way it has to be for us to continue making it. Um, but I would love for I would love for that to happen. At the time I can only see it on the computer or the, uh, download. It's not so comfortable. And, yeah. Uh, and uh, in, in German language, I think it's you have a big problem for this. Mm -hmm. More fans say they don't want to do. And can I say I've done a lot of conventions across the United States over the last five years. And I've been a guest at a lot of conventions, and I've, I've been to a lot of conventions just as a, as a, as a you know, visitor like yourselves. And this is my first trip to Germany, and the fans here have been unbelievably welcoming. I've never met nicer people anywhere, ever. So thank you all. I mean, people have been walking up to me and shaking my hand and asking me for my autograph and telling me how much they love the show. And, that's, that's the best compliment because you know what? I'm not a star, I'm not a celebrity, I'm a fellow fan. So thank all of you for the warm welcome. I can't thank you enough. You guys are terrific. This has been a wonderful experience. When they said, they told me thank you for the music. And now I'm going to go ahead and say, that absolutely it is amazing. You go away. <laughs> you want to screen an episode or something. I want to take a couple more questions because there's other people here. Besides, they've all downloaded the episode anyway. It is not yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I know that you that you shouldn't talk about people who aren't uh, present, but for me it was a bit confusing to see uh, many episodes with many actors of Spark. Can you tell us something about why you had, I think, three or four? I've had three. Three. I've had three. Okay. And I'm not going to have any more. My new guy is my spot. Sure? Yeah. Promise? I promise. Okay. What happened was, um, we had um, a terrific young guy named Jeff Quinn, and he played Spock, and he lived in Maryland, and he would drive up to play Spock. And um, he'd been doing it for a couple of years, 
he got a, a, a chance for a really fantastic job working on Battlestar Galactica. He got to go and work in the visual effects department and help coordinate doing the special effects. And he called me just before we were getting ready to shoot Blood and Fire and he said, I have a really big problem. And I said, what's the matter? And he said, I've got this great opportunity. Because he had been unemployed for uh, quite a while. And he, he said, I've got this great opportunity. I can work for the real Battlestar Galactica and, and all this. But I, he said, I, there's a good chance that they're not going to give me the time to come back and play Spock when you start in June. And I thought, do your best. And if you can, don't worry about it. I certainly understand that you have a great opportunity and you have to take it. So that's why Jeff left. He actually moved to California and he worked full time on Battlestar Galactica. And I'm not sure if he's on Caprica or not. I haven't spoke to him in over a year and a half. Our lives are just moving in different directions now. And so at the last minute, we were getting ready to film Blood and Fire. We had no Spock. We had, oh my God, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? So a young man named Ben Tolpin had auditioned for the part of Alex Freeman. But he wasn't right for that. And I started going through the, the, the audition things that we had, and when I saw him, I thought, wow, he might be a good Spock. So I called him up at the last minute, and I said, would you be interested? And he said, yeah. He hopped a plane, he came out. I thought he did a terrific job. Um, he is a busy, busy man. If you watch, and of course you're in Germany, but on American television, Ben Tolpin is on all kinds of commercials. He makes his living doing television commercials. He, he does all kinds of, of commercials. He has blonde, curly hair, so he's hard to recognize. But he's on a lot of commercials. And it was very difficult for him to leave California and come to New York and be in New York for two weeks with no cell phone service, no computer, because where we film is very rural. So there's, it's very hard to have a cell phone and you have no internet connection for two weeks. And when you're trying to maintain your job and you need your agent to call you, you can't commit to being away for that long a period. So that's why Ben couldn't play Spock. And we love Ben to death. But then I got really lucky. On the set of J.J. Abrams' Star Trek movie, a young man walked up to me. He said, aren't you that internet Star Trek guy? And I said, yeah. He said, hi, my name is Brandon. And uh, we started talking. And that was it. He walked away. You know, just asked me about what I was doing. A couple of days later, when I was getting ready to leave, he walked by me again. And I thought it was Zachary Kinto. He was Zachary's stand-in on the new film. He was his, his body double, and he looks just like him. And so he, we had exchanged, uh, you know, cards and information. And when we were looking for Ben's replacement, I called him and I said, "Would you be interested in playing Spock for me?" And he said, "I'm there. I'm there." And so he shot four episodes with me, and he's coming back to do his fifth in June. Yeah, fifth. So, and he's terrific. You can see by the clip. He's Spock all the way. He, he's nailed it, and he looks like uh, uh, Zachary and Leonard both. He's got the nose and the whole presence. So he's, he's perfect. I don't want any other Spock. <laughs> Hi, um, I uh, never saw the homepage of yours. What's the matter with you? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I uh, heard about you on this show uh, yesterday. Just yesterday? Yes. From yeah. Fedcon? From Fed See, Peter, it's working. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a great promotion. Uh, but I was wondering if we have German subtitles on your homepage. Uh, yes. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. Star Trek Star Trek. Star Trek. De okay. is our German mirror, and everything has subtitles. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. And thank these guys, they do the hard work, these two gentlemen, Stefan and Peter. Uh, okay, I've got an additional question, maybe to follow up to. Uh, that gentleman's question. Um, of course, you are not allowed to make money yes. with uh, Phase 2, that's natural. But uh, would it be possible to release a DVD uh, edition of the series at some point for charity purposes? No, absolutely not. They still view that as somebody, i.e. the charity, making money from Star Trek. So it's a very tough... Uh, you have to protect your, your copyrights and so forth in the United States. It's very difficult. And it, believe me, Paramount is very gracious and we love them dearly for letting us do this. You know, I would rather, as much as I would like to make a living doing Star Trek, I would rather not make money if it means I can just keep playing Star Trek. I've been playing Captain Kirk since I was this high. 
I, I used to run around in the backyard with my friends in our homemade costumes, our toy phasers. I tell everybody, I'm still doing that, but the toys are much better. <laughs> so I'm, I'm still playing. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, I will tell you this, they are redoing my website. Uh, they just finished the forum, and they moved that, and they're doing a lot of work. They're now redoing the main website. And the good news is that any of you that are computer savvy, you will now be able to go on and you will be able to download full Blu-ray quality versions of the episodes. And, and these guys <laughs> so, so you'll be able to bring them home and burn them yourselves and watch them as much or as little as you want because people have been writing and writing and writing to us saying, why can't we? And I'll tell you, originally we didn't, we used to release a standard DVD version. And then what happened was, I went to a Star Trek convention and the dealers were selling the DVDs. I was furious. I walked around the room with two other people and started confiscating the DVDs. And they said, you can't do that. I said, bullshit. That's my property. You can't sell it. If I can't make money, you're not going to make money. And so I put the hammer down and I stopped releasing DVD quality files. But then I realized I'm hurting my fellow fans. Just because there's a couple of rotten apples in the world doesn't mean I should deprive the millions of you that download it and love it and would never do that to somebody. So I, I've realized that that's what we're going to do. We're going to release the episodes and we're going to hope that these other people have learned their lesson and not to do those kinds of things. Because we work hard to make them for free and Paramount lets us make them. And we don't want to do anything to upset the studio that gives us Star Trek to begin with. So when you download the episodes, Make sure they're for you and your friends and family and nobody's doing anything crazy, okay? Try to do that for me. <laughs> so we're getting kind of up. Stefan is getting panicky. He keeps looking at his watch. No, no, no. <laughs> Grab that mic on. There you go. When can, when can I download a new series with uh, German subtitles? I now. think you can download the German uh, subtitled episodes right now from Star Trek Phase 2.de. Yeah, they're already subtitled. The one we showed last night, there was a problem with the, with the version we brought with subtitles. It was a part of the episode that somehow got, got cut out. And I said to them, oh, you can't air it like that because it won't make any sense. So I was hoping that, you know, there was enough people that understood English that it would be okay. But uh, it has been rectified, I guess. You already said that you made a deal with Paramount that you're not allowed to make any profits or anything, mm -hmm. but are you at least allowed to make so much money out of it that you can finance the whole project, or do you still have to pay for it to be able to make it, but are not allowed well, to get Here's money? the beautiful part of this. We've been doing it so long, all the expensive stuff, the sets and all that stuff, we've, we've already got it. So now it's nowhere near as expensive to make a show as it would be if we were starting from scratch. And I tell everybody that it's, our show is Star Trek for fans, by the fans. And I mean that because my uh, team literally stretches around the planet. They come from every country, every state in the United States. And everybody works for nothing, for the joy of making Star Trek. And you have to give those people a big hand. That would be no show without everybody that contributes because they all do something special and unique to bring the episodes to everybody. Everybody. So it's it's expensive because you have to factor in the labor. Um, when Mr. Richter is doing the visual effects, it, you know, if he's taking 12 hours out of his schedule to do something that he's not getting paid for, that e equates to a certain amount of money. And so I bow <laughs> to people like him that work on this show because it is a. It is People are artists and craftsmen and so talented and they just do it because they, like me, they love Star Trek. Well, I just wanted to make an addition that uh, you already said that the new Star Trek movie from Abrams is good. It's a good movie, but um, um, what I want to say, and I guess many people here will agree, it's not the real new Star Trek. I think you do the real new Star Trek and they should you. have you. <laughs> Hollywood that I've never understood 
it, they make a product and they expect the consumer or they hope that, this, that the consumer is going to like the product and pay money for the product. So if you make something that the public really wants and then you don't make it anymore or you change it and you wonder why they don't buy it, you think they would understand that. But for some reason, they don't. And I, I believe that us, we as fans know what we want to see. Don't we? We understand what we like. Maybe we can't explain it, but we know this is what we like. I remember in 1979, I was very excited about Star Trek The Motion Picture. And I saw it, and I still liked it because it was, the, it was my heroes back. But a little part of me was disappointed because it didn't look like the original series. And all I ever wanted was more of the original series, and we never got it. And so when they said they were going to make this big budget Star Trek 2009, and it was going to be about Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, I thought, yes. Now it's going to look like the original series because they see all this interest and resurgence in classic Star Trek. And parts of it did. The uniforms and certain elements did look like classic Star Trek, but they zipped it up. They, they brought it up to, to 21st century standards, I guess. And, and I understand why. Because they felt that the Star Trek fan base has, has dwindled, and they thought that we're going to reach a broader audience, and I think in a lot of ways they did. Um, I have seen children running along with Star Trek toys, and I haven't seen that in a long time. So it has gotten everybody jazzed about Star Trek, and I feel vindicated by the fact that they made it because it's about Kirk and Spock. And to me, Kirk and Spock are Star Trek. As much as I like the other shows, the original is still the best. So. I want to ask a question to another project of yours, to Buck Rogers Begins. How did you get Jill Dura and Eric Gray, and when will we be able to see Buck Rogers Begins? Well, um, and for those of you that don't know, the success of my Star Trek project um, has allowed me to get the rights to Buck Rogers. And I can make Buck Rogers for profit. Yeah. So now I'm, a, now I'm a real producer. <laughs> so we, uh, we wanted to find a way to, to bring Buck Rogers back that wasn't silly and disco and all that from the 70s. So we went all the way back to the original comic strip, uh, 1928. And um, I had this goofy idea before I started looking at the comic strips. I said, you know, I really like current uh, television shows on the CW network. I like Smallville. Uh, anybody like Smallville? Yeah. I like The Vampire Diaries. I love Supernatural. <laughs> so I wanted to find a way to bring a little bit of that youth and hipness to Buck Rogers. So I said, let's make Buck Rogers 20 years old. And everybody on my staff went, you're kidding. I said, no, let's make him 20 years old. Maybe the younger people will connect with him and you know, we'll find a success with it. So then my um, good friend and my assistant, Patty, bought me uh, the collected works of Buck Rogers, which had all the old comic strips reprinted. And I opened it up, and the very first page is uh, my autobiography by Buck Rogers. So this was the cartoon character telling me his story in his own words. And the first paragraph, the first sentence said, it was, I was just 20 years old when I was mustered out of the Air Corps after the end of the Great War. And I thought, you're kidding. <laughs> he was 20 years old in the original conversation. And then it made sense. Yes, he was 20 years old. He was a pilot in World War I. They were young children, and they'd had a very short life expectancy when they were fighting that war. So that was my answer. Take the character back to the 1920s. Um, we'll start the pilot at the end of World War I. We'll follow the comic strip. We'll let the comic strip lead us to where the character should go. So that's what we did. And we're shooting the pilot. We'll finish it up this summer. Um, we've already shot a, a, bunch of, a bunch of it. And um, I have this great young actor named Bobby Rice who's playing uh, Lucas Buck Rogers. And we got Gar uh, Gil Gerard and Aaron Gray from the 1980s television series to come back and play Buck's parents in the pilot. And uh, we did some test animations. Uh, Mr. Richter's company did a, a rocket ship test for me, and we put it out on the internet, and all hell broke loose. And now everybody is dying to see our version of Buck Rogers. So 
If all goes well, we will have uh, the first half of the pilot available in the fall. So cross your fingers. We're excited about it. It's going to be fun. Stefan, are you going to ask me a question or tell me to get off stage? No. No, boss, I would never do it. So, I got a question. Um, with the re release of Bug Rogers, um, is the uh, time between the episodes, will it be that long compared to Phase 2? They will be an hour long. The episodes will be an hour long, just like watching television. Yeah. The, the, the production. Yeah, actually, now you need about, uh, you shoot two episodes per, per year. Mm -hmm. yeah. Phase two, and how are you going to deal with that with Buck Rogers? Well, the, the difference will be if Buck Rogers is a success and I can continue to make Buck Rogers. I hope so. If, me too. That will be self-supportive. That will give me money, and the people that work on Buck Rogers will be professional hired hands, and the Star Trek people will still be playing Star Trek because they told me they won't quit. So. And you could pay to yes, <laughs> and I can pay to buy yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. yes. Well, I'm a huge fan of Bobby Rice, uh, since I saw him in this other fancy old hidden foot here by Rob, Rob Caves, mm -hmm. and so uh, we'll see him in... Uh, He's a great young actor. Third. He's got a great future. He's got a great future. Looking forward to it. Thanks. Okay. Anybody else? Somebody. Don't leave me here. Uh, regarding Mark Rogers, yes. um, so what's the, the plan in the end? I mean, now you're shooting the pilot, mm -hmm. so if it's successful, what's the idea? Um, the idea would be for 13 additional episodes, 13 episodes. Like, a, like a full season's worth of episodes. And, but again, it all comes down to you know, the financing and all of that. We have a couple of major companies that are interested, um, and if, if they like the pilot, they certainly like the footage we released already because they, they contacted us. So one of them is Sony Pictures, and the other is Shout Factory, a home video distributor, and we, do, you know, we don't know yet. Uh, but if the product is definitely good enough and they like it, um, uh, we're hoping that they're going to buy it. You know, we'll figure out who gives us the best offer, and uh, we'll go from there. So there's an option. This is going maybe even to television. Or yes, or yes. We are. Uh, I can tell you that one of the things that I'm preparing to do is try to actively market the show to Sci-Fi Network. I would love to see it picked up and go to Sci-Fi. Um, and but you have to understand, Hollywood works a certain way. I'm, I'm an outsider. I'm not a union member. So there's a lot of difficulties. Um, however, if you can produce something outside of the Hollywood system and it's good enough, they will buy it. And it's like making uh, an independent movie and screening it at Sundance or something and then it gets picked up by a distributor and released. This is kind of being done in that vein. So again, cross your fingers. Uh, I think we've got a great pilot. We've got a great cast. We've got a good story, a very emotional story about a 20-year-old kid in the middle of a war who comes home from this tragic experience and starts to put his life back together. And then all of a sudden, his entire life is ripped away yet again because he's tossed into the 25th century and everybody he knows and loves is now left behind. He's the only person alive 500 years later. So it's a pretty cool story. So this, this sounds like a space opera. Uh, like, yeah, you know, I, you know, I'm treating it very much like Star Trek. Uh, I want the characters to be very real and to be very well liked and the story to be um, a very believable and a message in the story, because I think that's important. I want the audience to connect with this 20-year-old guy and, and feel what he's feeling and want to go on this journey with him, you know, into the future so that he can find himself and, and rebuild his life. And uh, most people don't realize that the original character, Buck Rogers, was more or less a secret agent. He works for the Earth Defense Directorate and he's, he's you know, an operative. He's not a spaceman. So it's going to be an interesting journey. The first uh, episodes will be very Earth-based. They won't be, you know, completely zipping around in spaceships and all that. They'll be kind of Earth-based and very techy. And uh, um, the, the look of the show is what we call uh, contemporary retro, some, and, and, and it has a heavy dose of steampunk. So I think everybody's going to like it. Wish you good luck. Thank you. Hi, James. Hello. Uh, there have been some uh, picture already on the internet uh, that you're. Uh, trying to introduce Lieutenant Arix on the Enterprise. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about this? Well, <laughs> Tobias is giving me the evil eye. I um, never liked the animated series, so don't throw anything at me. Um, I just found them hard to watch because the animation was so bad, and I couldn't, the voices didn't work with that animation for me. 
should have heard the German dubbing voices. Yeah, they're even worse. Sounded like a car. <laughs> well, anyway, I never really liked the animated series, but I did like the idea of having these really cool aliens as part of the crew. And we've had a lot of people say, oh, great. can you do Lieutenant Eric? Can you please bring out Lieutenant Eric? So one afternoon I called Mr. Richter and I said what I wanted to do, and uh, he thought I was crazier than I am. Um, and so we left it as, uh, well, you know, uh, I'll see, we'll do some, we'll do some research, and, uh, but don't get your hopes up because it's a very difficult thing to do. And uh, some time went by and uh, we exchanged an email and he said, okay, we've built him. I said, you what? He said, we built him. And he sent me this beautiful test image and I just was flabbergasted at how beautiful that it looks. And uh, he's still working with his team on the design and how to make it all work and we're trying to work out all the, the physicality of shooting it properly and, and making it easier for them. And uh, So at the beginning of the child we're actually reshooting so that Erex will be in that episode and our hope is to have it done for you know summertime, end of summertime. So we're working on it but we're all excited about it and everybody on the internet went crazy. Uh, and I think Tobias wanted to shoot me because I released the picture but I really wanted the fans to see the incredible you knew it was coming. We, we just wanted everybody to see the incredible work that, that he and his team do and, and get them excited about, oh, well, this is the first time you're going to see this guy live and breathe. So again, Tobias Richter, ladies and gentlemen, he's going to do it. So thank you. So where are we at time-wise? Probably gone way over. Okay, now I'm done. You want to screen the episode now? Okay, that's it. Thank you for coming. I hope to see you all again. Enjoy the episode.